Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is uh, Wednesday the 1st of December 2021 and in this programme tonight we'll be discussing the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbour, also of the Pearl Harbour attack by the Japanese, also known as the Day of Infamy. Uh, and it was the attack on the US naval port in Pearl Harbour that dragged the United States into the war and, and uh, we'll be discussing its, uh, its impact 80 years on and, and where is America and the West now 80 years on from this uh, day of infamy. Um, Reagan, wh whenever you think of Pearl Harbor, you also now recently think of 9-11, but Pearl Harbor, wasn't it, was the biggest attack mm. on US soil by any nation and um, shocked America out of its complacency and out of its neutrality. Uh, and then FDR, President FDR, announced that he, America was going to enter the war and declared war on Japan. Um, as an American, what does Pearl Harbor mean to you and to America, and how deeply is it intertwined into the American psyche? Well, I do remember 20 years ago now at 9-11 that uh, there was th this sense of, oh, this is our, our second Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was the deadliest attack on U.S. soil after Pearl Harbor, and so uh, discussion of the two um, was often intertwined. There was regular reference. It was only the 60th anniversary. There were still plenty of survivors from Pearl Harbor uh, who were around many people. I would have grown um, up as a child around in the United States, had uh, very vivid memories of uh, that stage of the war. Some would have participated in um, combat as well or um, in some of the other phases um, afterwards. So it, it's definitely something that is still there in a, a large sector of, of the American populace's consciousness. However, I am concerned that um, as with many areas of history, both um, older and more recent, uh, U.S. related and non-U.S. related, uh, there's not the appreciation of history that there should be. There's not learning the lessons that um, can be gleaned from history uh, as, as much as there should be. I, I worry that my generation, if you were to just go outside on a high street in a major um, city in the United States and, and ask their thoughts on Pearl Harbor, you might you might get the response of uh, befuddlement or confusion. What, what, what's that? What are you talking about? What, what's a Pearl Harbor? What, you know, is it, is it uh, someone might even think it's some sort of jewelry shop. I, I, it, it, it's that bizarre and that sad. Um, when I've tried to engage, even on recent history, like Pearl Harbor, elements of World War II with um, Americans in their late teens, early 20s, um, sometimes beyond, um, very often, there's just not history taught as it should be in schools. And, and so I, I think it's important, Simon, um, thank you for, um, for, for this program, for um, you know, the, the opportunity to talk through the, uh, the 80th anniversary of it. It needs to be remembered, this date needs to be commemorated, um, and it shouldn't be forgotten. Yeah, so just to remind you, the Day of Infamy uh, occurred on Sunday the 7th of December. Uh, 1941, uh, just before uh, 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, when hundreds of Japanese uh, fighter planes bombed the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, which is Hawaii. Uh, then uh, we see that the Japanese destroyed and damaged 20 American naval vessels, including eight battleships and over 300 aircraft. 
it was uh, with the loss of over 2,400 American um, Navy personnel and together with another 1,000 wounded that deeply shocked America. And I'm just going to read out this, um, this speech by FDR very briefly. Um, it says, the day after the terrifying attack, US President Franklin D. Roosevelt addressed both houses of Congress to declare war on Japan. The president said yesterday, December the 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the empire of Japan. He said, no matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. I believe I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but we will make very certain that this form of treachery shall never endanger us again. Um, and of course, this led America into the war. And, and, and prior to that, I mean, America got involved late during the uh, First World mm. War and it, it, a lot of Americans then resented this. Mm. The fact that American troops had to go to Europe to into foreign war to, to defend uh, European liberties. Uh, and of course, then we saw then this growing American isolationism after the uh, depression of the um, late 1920s and early 30s. Uh, and then this policy of appeasement and of course, the uh, Second World War started in, uh, on the 1st of September uh, 1939 when mm. the Germans invaded Poland, but the Americans were not in any way interested in coming mm. to the aid of Britain uh, or France or the beleaguered European countries mm. that had completely been overrun um, by the Nazi blitzkrieg. Well, it was, a, it was a real shame, and it's one of those things you can uh, look and see some political motivations behind it. Uh, there was a very large population uh, that had roots in Germany in the United States and so uh, politically th there would have been the question is it expedient to enter this war when uh, so many of our people have German roots um, he, it's wrong reasoning it's trying to to establish what, what's ethical based on um, okay who, who's winning uh, FDR didn't want to enter World War two but this was the first attack on U.S. soil uh, by an outside party. The American consciousness up to this point, following uh, the War for Independence, uh, the Revolutionary War, um, the War of 1812, was very much focused on liberty, very much focused on freedom, focused on democracy, focused on um, on not repeating the mistakes of Europe's past, or not getting involved in uh, a history that was extremely bloody. But I mean, it, it, it's not made a, a great go of it. In its entire history, the U.S. has only been free from involvement in any war for 20 years. Uh, around 20 years, it's been f free of any involvement in any war. So it's not really succeeded in its um, its endeavor. World War II really marks uh, the moment where the U.S. enters into its powerhouse mode as um, the expression sometimes used negatively, and I do understand why it can be used negatively, the world's police. Um, this is where it becomes that. From this yeah, moment, is a world everything yeah. changes. And, and really, World War II was so much more global than World War I. We, we see fronts, um, especially as a result of Pearl Harbor in the Far East. That wasn't just focused on Japan. We have to remember that China was always uh, there as well, and that there was some involvement in, in China. We have to remember um, the British then became involved um, as well in, in Burma. There was um, some massive stuff going on in relation um, to Japan. That Japan was doing to Asia what Germany was doing to Europe. And by God's grace, um, he used uh, this tragic event uh, with catastrophic loss of life to wake America up, to uh, shock its leaders into gear, to, to recognize, okay, 
we need to help our friends and our allies uh, who are, are really struggling. The, the UK was pretty much on its own by well, that Well, it's pretty much a, uh, you know, a miracle that Britain um, wasn't actually invaded by the Nazis point, at Dunkirk. Exactly. And uh, we saw at Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain and followed by the Blitz. I mean, uh, Britain was just a, a frontier on its own uh, yeah. over Europe, which was completely Nazi-occupied. Um, and Churchill course, had asked for help, and, and FDR and, and, said no. <laughs> also, the threat, I only learned recently as well, the threat that um, a Nazi invasion from, um, from Norway mm. goes to Scotland. So you always look at it thinking it's coming from France, but it was also that threat in the north as well. So, of course, this, was, this is what Churchill was waiting for, for the Americans to, to enter the war. And, of course, this is exactly what happened. So we actually are live. Uh, we are interactive tonight as we mark the 80th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attacks that uh, will actually take place on Tuesday, the 7th of December. Uh, and because it's an anniversary, we have to do it early. Uh, and it's important that we do it early because this is such an important topic to discuss tonight. So uh, please feel free to email into the program or text into the program. And the question tonight is really, um, what lessons can we learn from the Pearl Harbor attack uh, 80 years on? And um, we have this uh, brilliant uh, archive news footage of what occurred on uh, Sunday the 7th of December, uh, 8am, in 1941 in Pearl Harbor. Your commentator is Joe O'Brien. Here is the motion picture record released by the United States Navy of the havoc wrought by the Japs' sneak sky and sea raid on Pearl Harbor, America's mid-Pacific naval bastion. On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Costly to our Navy was the loss of war vessels, airplanes and equipment, but more costly to Japan was the effectiveness of its foul attack in immediately unifying America in its determination to fight and win the war thrust upon it and to win the peace that will follow. The Japs copied their German masters in striking hard at airfields. Hickam Field, northwest of Honolulu, and the Ford Island Naval Plane Base were the first objectives of Japan's treachery. Scores of planes were bruised and battered by the Japs' aerial bombs. Many of these were demolished beyond repair. Direct hits were scored on hangars and these were badly shattered. Equipment and airplane supplies were reduced to smoldering ruins. Here at the Naval Air Station is grim and positive evidence of Jap treachery. Here foul blows were struck while Jap diplomats were talking peace in Washington. America lost three destroyers. Here are seen the United States destroyers Downs and Shaw as they rest on the bottom of Pearl Harbor with decks awash after Jap bombers make direct hits on their decks. First to feel the sting of Japanese steel are the USS Oklahoma and Utah, the latter a 33-year-old target ship. Accurate hits by the enemy bombers make short work of these two naval bulwarks. Now with their keels practically out of water, they lie helpless wrecks and a sad reminder of cowardly strategy. To make possible a surprise attack within Pearl Harbor, the Japs built two manned submarines to enable them to fire sneak blows within waters that are narrow and tortuous. Several of these surprise weapons were blown from the water by direct hits of our naval gunners. Others were beached and captured. While sky and sea fire were still raging, salvage crews inspected our naval craft to estimate what may be saved. Before the din of bursting bombs had been silenced, preparations were underway to salvage these two warships. At low tide, the huge propeller of the Oklahoma, stilled by the enemy, was high above water. It is believed that the small two-man Jap submarines carrying dual torpedo tubes were responsible for these two losses to our Pacific fleet. Here 
Here is the actual bombing of the mighty USS Arizona by Jap planes. These pictures were made by a fearless cameraman who thought nothing of his personal safety to make possible this record for all posterity. A single lucky hit was responsible for the disaster that befell the Arizona when a Jap bomb falling directly through one of the battleship's funnels exploded in the engine room and set ablaze tons of fuel oil. Dense black smoke billowed to the sky as the massive control tower began to keel over. The Arizona's courageous crew stuck to its guns until the very end. Here was displayed heroism that will live forever in the glorious annals and traditions of the American Navy. The once mighty Arizona now rests on Pearl Harbor's muddy bottom, a pitiful relic of its former self, a grim monument to the treachery of Japan. The once mighty dreadnought's armor plate is twisted and torn, but the great battleship's control tower still stands, a defiant beacon that in days to come will cast its shadow upon Nippon's very shores. At Pearl Harbor, at Hickam Field, in the bomb-pocked streets of Honolulu, ever is written history. History with a tragic, treacherous pen. History that 130 million Americans will never forget. And in days to come, the Japs, too, will remember Pearl Harbor. Here is a tragic, unforgettable page in the annals of America. Here the cunning deceit of the Japs will never be forgotten. Here they hoped to score a knockout before the war began. The Arizona's gun crews, battered and broken, fired to the last. Their guns pointed skyward from whence the enemy appeared. The Jap sneak blow cost hundreds of military and civilian lives. The treacherous attack cost our Pacific fleet two battleships outright, another capsized, the loss of three destroyers and a mine layer. While bombs were still bursting and flames still pouring from our shattered naval craft, a light United States cruiser valiantly moves out to join the fleet and avenge Pearl Harbor. Well, we're very thankful there to the American Military Archive for that very valuable footage. Uh, reminder to our viewers that we are live and interactive, and we're asking the question this evening, what lessons can the West learn from Pearl Harbor, uh, the attack um, after 80 years? We're looking at the 80-year anniversary of this catastrophic event. Now, the question that some people might ask is, well, okay, well, we saw there at the beginning of that old footage, Hawaii, uh, Pearl Harbor is in Hawaii, right? And uh, Hawaii is very clearly not attached to the mainland. So it's a long way from the mainland. It's a long it? way from the mainland. Uh, like, w w what exactly is going on with that? How did the Americans first come to be in Hawaii at all? By that point, uh, just a reminder, Hawaii was not even a state. It is the most recent state added to uh, the Union. It was added in 1959. But uh, the first settlers of the Hawaiian Islands uh, were uh, Polynesians. They, uh, from what we know anyway, uh, settled in about the 8th century um, on the islands. Uh, you can read more about how that took place on history.com or um, do some research on that. But American traders came to Hawaii for the island's sandalwood, uh, and that was highly valued in China. And it, indeed, um, you know, sandal, sandalwood, you, you can understand why they would have gone there for it. Really nice fragrance, um, really great. Uh, but in the 1830s, we saw the introduction of the sugar industry. By the mid-19th century, Hawaii had become its own independent established country recognized um, uh, across the world. 
Around that time, uh, as with many other places, we see uh, America has sent missionaries. There are missionaries working in Hawaii and serving there. There are also plantation owners who have brought some uh, social and economic um, boom to uh, the environment, and that obviously would have led to changes as well. In 1840, a constitutional monarchy was established, stripping the Hawaiian monarch of much of his authority. In 1893, a group of American expats and sugar planters uh, supported by a division of U.S. Marines deposed um, the, the queen at the time, who was the last remaining monarch of Hawaii. And one year later, it became a U.S. protectorate with Hawaiian-born Sanford B. Dole as president, uh, with many in Congress opposing the formal annexation of Hawaii. Uh, it was not until 1898, following the use of the naval base in, at Pearl Harbor during the Spanish-American War, and that Hawaii's strategic importance became evident and formal annexation uh, was approved. Uh, two years later, Hawaii was organized into a formal U.S. territory. Uh, we, we have some of these territories as well today, the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, th there's a handful of others. but. Um, during World War II, Hawaii became firmly ensconced in the American national identity as a direct result of the Pearl Harbor attack. And in uh, March 1959, the U.S. government approved statehood uh, for Hawaii. In June, the Hawaiian people voted by a wide majority to accept admittance into the United States. And two months later, Hawaii became the 50th state. So that's sort of the, the background as to how America became involved in Hawaii and how Hawaii became a part of America. Yeah, which is uh, fascinating. It's important yeah. to get that historical context as well. Um, so to give the historical context to uh, why the United States was attacked uh, Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941, um, in the late 1930s, the American foreign policy uh, in the Pacific hinge on uh, US support for China and aggression against China by Japan, therefore necessarily would bring Japan into conflict with the United States. Uh, we see that as early as 1931, the uh, Tokyo government had extended its control over the Chinese province of Manchuria, uh, and, follow, and the following year the Japanese cemented their hold on the region with the creation of a puppet state. Uh, a clash at Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing on the 7th of July 1937 uh, signaled the beginning of open warfare between Japan and the United Front of Chinese Nationalists and the Chinese Communist Party. And in response, the United States government extended its first loan to China in 1938. Then in July 1939, uh, the US announced the termination of the 1911 Treaty of Commerce and Navigation with Japan. Uh, beginning in the summer of 1940, the US began to restrict uh, the exports to Japan of materials useful in war. And between June 1940 and uh, the fateful crisis of December 1941, uh, the tension constantly mounted. We also see that in July 1941, by which time the Japanese had occupied all of Indochina and had entered into an alliance with the Axis powers, uh, Germany and Italy, the US government se uh, severed all commercial and financial relations with Japan, uh, Japanese assets were frozen, and an embargo was declared on uh, shipments to Japan of petroleum and other vital war materials. Then we see that the militarists within the Japanese regime were steadily gaining influence in the uh, government in Tokyo. Uh, they bitterly resented US aid to China, uh, which by this time had been stepped up. They saw the German invasion of the Soviet Union uh, as an unrivaled opportunity, as it were, to pursue a policy of aggression in the Far East without danger of an attack on their nearby forces by the Red Army. Uh, and nevertheless, we saw negotiations were taking place uh, to find an understanding from, between the United States and Japan that took place in the autumn of uh, 1941 and uh, not until the end of November did it become clear that no agreement was possible. So that's the US foreign policy, its context as we build up to the, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan continued to negotiate with the United States uh, to the day of the Pearl Harbor attack. Um, the government of the Prime Minister um, Toyo Hideki uh, decided on war. That was their, their conclusion, that was the decision uh, that they made. And the, 
consciousness of the Japanese people was, um, from, from what we can see, fully behind uh, that decision. There was this idea of um, the empire on which the sun would never set. Uh, there was definitely a, a real sense of pride um, that, that was attached to it. Now, Admiral Yamamoto Isaruko, the commander-in-chief of Japan's combined fleet, had planned the attack against the U.S. Pacific fleet with great care. There was strategizing um, involved. Once the U.S. fleet was out of action, the way for an unhindered Japanese conquest of all Southeast Asia in the Indonesian archipelago would be open. The order for the assault was given on November 5, 1941. On November 16th, the task force began its rendezvous in the Kuril Islands. And commanders were instructed that the fleet might be recalled in case of a favorable outcome with those negotiations you were talking about um, going on in Washington, D.C. But on November 26th, Vice Admiral Nagumo Chiuchi led a fleet in, including six aircraft carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, and 11 destroyers to a point some 275 miles north of Hawaii. From there, about 360 planes in total were launched. Now, Simon, looking at all of this context and the background, what happened? Like, how is it that the U.S was caught completely asleep um, on, on that fateful day, 7th of December. I, I, I think what we see is uh, a naivety, I think, in terms of um, American preparedness for war. That's the first thing. I think also the fact that uh, America hadn't actually been attacked by a major power. I mean, we saw a, a couple of uh, German U-boats would attack the east coast of America during the First World War. But apart from that, and apart from the British attack on uh, on, on Washington DC with inside uh, the United States, um, there really hadn't been a kind of major uh, military offensive on, uh, on America's uh, interests. So I think what we saw then is, is massive intelligence failures. Um, we see here that the US uh, Pacific Fleet uh, that had been stationed at Pearl Harbor uh, since April 1940, in addition to the nearly 100 naval uh, vessels, including eight battleships, and uh, there were substantial military and air forces. As attention mounted, uh, Admiral Husband E. Camille and uh, Lieutenant uh, General uh, Walter C. Scott, uh, who shared the common command at Pearl Harbor, were warned of the possibility of war, uh, specifically on October the 16th, and then again on November the uh, 24th and the 27th, uh, the notice of the 27th of Kamal began with dispatch is to be consider considered a war warning. Uh, went on to say that uh, negotiations have uh, ceased and, uh, direct and directed the Admiral to execute appropriate defensive deployments. I mean, there's also a case here where um, a young US uh, intelligence analyst uh, was picking up on radar. And this is really, I mean, ra radar was pretty much in his infancy and um, saw these little green dots on the radar coming and said, look, there's a massive Japanese invasion coming. And uh, they were told, no, this is probably an American um, Air Force uh, operation or just a kind of test run so we can ignore it. I mean, that was the first evidence to know that a, a, a full-scale war was coming. It's just scare tactics. You know, this is one of the failures. I think I agree with your assessment there, Simon, of naivety. Um, in many ways, the US probably thought Japan is not ready or prepared um, for a full-scale war with a nation of our size. The U.S. Uh, underestimated the brutality um, of the Japanese army. They underestimated its power, its might. Don't, don't forget the um, the power they were having even um, over the um, the whole of eastern China. Essentially, they I mean, they were gaining masses of ground uh, across Asia in a way um, comparable to Nazi Germany. So. Um, you, you look at it and you think, was the U.S. ignorant? We can't discuss the context that we've already walked through. And but say but that even Washington, ignorant. for example, ignored these warnings. It mm. wasn't just the, uh, you know, the admirals and the U.S. Naval Command in, in um, Hawaii that uh, missed these intelligence um, information. It was also Washington as well. It was yeah. uh, FDR as well and his, his administration that didn't really see this coming either.
No, they, they completely muffed it. <laughs> there, was, there was no concept of um, imminent war. The, uh, there was no desire to enter into the European front. And I, in fairness, I think there probably would have been a, an element of national pride that was in denial that we're going to be entering war with Japan. Japan's not going to mess with, with us in this way. We're going to come to some solution. Things are a bit tense and terse, but uh, they strongly underestimated what was about to happen, hence why we had two and a half thousand um, dead and a thousand seriously but, but FDR would have thought as, as US president, look, I've kept America out of this war. Yeah. Um, the Canadians, because they're part of the British Commonwealth, are fighting with the with the British, and uh, most of the Canadian forces uh, live near near. My, they, they they were stationed near my mm -hmm. home in in Surrey, um, so we see that they were based all over uh, southern England. But I think uh, FDR was proud that uh, you know America was not in the war. I'm keeping America safe. I'm keeping the citizens of America safe. Um, but in the face of such horrendous evil. Uh, this obviously resulted in America getting involved in, uh, in the Second World War after the dreadful attack on Pearl Harbor. So we have an email here from John, a reminder that we are live and interactive. Uh, John says, I'm a skeptic about the official narrative. Events are highly controversial. The US people would never have agreed to join World War II without being victims of such an outrage. This was mirrored decades later with the 9-11 attacks. Will we ever really find out the full story? So, um, sometimes, John, um, I think we have to take um, at face value the history that is given and the accounts of eyewitnesses uh, and the evidence that, I mean, it's stacked high. I, I'm, I know where you're going with the 9-11 um, mirroring deal there, and I, I have to say I strongly disagree that there was anything um, sorted behind what was going on here, apart from the um, evil of, in one case, um, the, J uh, the Japanese seeking to um, gain dominance and seeking to build their empire, and in the other case, um, a group of radicalized um, jihadis. And of course also we saw the intelligence failure uh, on a path of uh, the US admirals that were based in uh, Pearl Harbor and, and um, Hawaii, that they didn't actually um, have um, scouting parties to go out to the north and reconnaissance over the north of the island mm. where this is where the Japanese were coming so uh, there was a huge huge intelligence failures but don't you think that sometimes we see this that the Lord allowed that to happen he definitely did um, in order to bring definitely. America into the world into the into the Second World War uh, and to fight alongside the British because you can guarantee that this is what Winston Churchill if he was praying at all um, would have been praying that the Americans would enter the war. This is what the British would, would have been praying. Ordinary Brits living during the Blitz would have been praying that America would enter the war on behalf of the Allied powers. Um, and that huge military power and might of the American force would be able to push back the, uh, the, uh, the Nazis and also push back the, the, uh, the Japanese. One of the things, Simon, that uh, we have to consider is uh, just the relationship between the UK and the US at the time. And the US was very friendly uh, with Great Britain, uh, FDR and, and Churchill had a line of communication, uh, but uh, honestly FDR was very unhelpful and very, um, in, in one way, cool when it came to uh, commenting in any way on what was going on um, on, on the front with Nazi Germany. Uh, we cannot play politics with moral issues. Uh, the United Kingdom was being forced into a situation where it was on its own against an evil uh, regime that was taking over the entirety of Europe. And the United States was happy to let that happen. I, I truly believe as an American that there would not have been um, any involvement from the US even if um, Nazi Germany had, had been successful in invading the United Kingdom. It truly didn't want to be involved. Um, but it, it, this is what it took. In God's sovereignty, it woke the United States up. It realized, um, and, and you look at it and say the motivations, 
might not have been fully pure. The U.S. needed some help. It needed some inroads. It needed some support on um, the, the Asian front of things. And so it worked. Uh, but yeah, it's one of those things that we have to recognize God's hand in it. Absolutely. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, take ourselves to the actual day of infamy itself, which was uh, Sunday, the 7th of December, 1941, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, at Pearl Harbor itself, there were instances, instances that uh, properly interpreted may have given a brief warning. Uh, this includes uh, four hours before a decisive moment, a Japanese submarine was sighted by the uh, minesweeper uh, USS Condor. And about two and a half hours later, the commander of the destroyer USS Ward sent a message saying that he had been, had attacked and had been fired upon and uh, dropped a death charges uh, upon the submarine operating in a defensive sea area near Pearl Harbor. In the same morning, uh, ours uh, US Army private, George Elliott, as I mentioned earlier, practicing on a radar set after its normal closing time, noticed a large flight of planes on the screen. And uh, when he telephoned his lieutenant, uh, he was told to disregard the observation as a flight of B-17 bombers from the United States was expected at the time. Once again, the opportunity had been missed. And then we see, do you want to read that? Uh, yes, and the first Japanese dive bomber then appeared over Pearl Harbor at uh, 7.55 a.m. local time. It was part of a first wave of nearly 200 aircraft, including torpedo planes, bombers, and fighters. Within a quarter of an hour, the various airfields at the base were subjected to this savage attack. And due to short anti-sabotage measures, the U.S. military aircraft were packed tightly together at the Naval Air Station on Ford Island and adjoining Wheeler and Hickam Fields. Many were destroyed on the ground um, by the Japanese. Uh, Wheeler Field in particular, the destruction was fearful. Of the 126 planes on the ground, 42 were totally destroyed, 41 were damaged, and only 43 were left fit for service. Only six U.S. planes even got into the air to repel the attackers of this first assault, and in total, more than 180 aircraft were destroyed. And we're, we're talking about essentially the U.S. Air Force being crippled in, in this uh, moment. And, and this was the U.S. Naval Fleet yeah. to protect the Pacific. Um, earlier today, I uh, did a, a Zoom interview with um, uh, Bill Koenig, um, the author of Eye to Eye, is also uh, a U.S. Uh, White House correspondent, and his father um, was a pilot in the U.S. in the U.S. Navy during the Second World War, and also fought against uh, the Japanese. And this is Bill's take on his father's involvement uh, during the Second World War to uh, fight against the Japanese. Now joined on Behind the Headlines from Bill Koenig, who is the author of Eye to Eye. He was also uh, a U.S. correspondent in the White House for over two decades, and uh, he's joining us now. Um, Bill, it's uh, great to see you. I know that you're in Texas um, and not in Jerusalem. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, it's great to be uh, with you, and uh, I always love to look at uh, the old city and uh, brings back many fond memories for us. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in this program today, uh, we are marking the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the attack on the US Navy uh, by Imperial Japan. Um, F.D. Roosevelt described this day as a day of infamy on the 7th of December 1941. Um, how will Americans be remembering this day? Uh, uh, what place, what role does Pearl Harbor play in the American psyche? Well, I think it depends on your age. Uh, we have a great appreciation for the great generation, which my father was part of and many of his friends and people that we look up to in, in our country today. We still have some World War II heroes alive, not many. Uh, and then the baby boomers, uh, we uh, grew up with uh, those wonderful parents uh, who had a great love for our country, who fought for our country. And so they're, uh, that Pearl Harbor Day was a very significant event in our nation's history, as well as the world's history, Simon. So unfortunately, uh, more and more people, uh, millennials and others, don't, don't recall or remember or even know much about uh, Pearl Harbor, which is sad because it was a very significant day uh, for our country. Uh, it, it's kind of like 9-11. I mean, we, we, 
These are uh, events in our history, uh, attacks, sneak attacks on our country that, uh, that we didn't anticipate, didn't see coming. And, but at the same time has uh, uh, given us a great appreciation for the people that uh, helped establish this wonderful country uh, that we uh, love so much. Uh, and uh, Bill, you talked about your, your father there. Um, your, your father was a, a pilot uh, with the, uh, the U.S. Navy and, and fought against uh, the Japanese. Um, can you share with us um, his experience of fighting against the Japanese and being a fight, an American fighter pilot? Yeah, my dad, at the age of 19, he was actually a U.S. Marine pilot, and uh, he flew in the Pacific. Uh, he he uh, shared some, you know, I had to pretty much get things out of him. You know, that's a, a lot of our uh, great generation are very private. But if you talk to him, uh, you can find out a lot about what it was like. I mean, he's 19 years of age, flying a 400-mile-an-hour uh, Corsair aircraft uh, off a uh, uh, aircraft carrier, uh, there was a lot of uh, casualties in the, in the uh, South Pacific. Uh, my father, matter of fact, he and some of his other Marine pilots were sent to a Navy carrier because they had such high casualties. So they flew off that carrier for a while. And these are true heroes. And what's interesting, and interesting, but what's sobering, uh, he would talk about going out uh, at night, uh, doing his fighting, and then coming back and half his uh, friends that he flew out with didn't return. And uh, you know, you're 19, 20 years of age, uh, and that has an incredible impact uh, on your life. And uh, he was a hero uh, to me, and as well as that generation. But it was just a, a lot of grit and sobering times, uh, difficult times, but we're thankful for them because of the freedom that we have in our country. Absolutely. Um, can you also talk about the uh, story involving uh, your father almost came to the end of the war uh, when his um, aircraft carrier was, was uh, approaching Japan and um, you, his, uh, his aircraft carrier came under attack by uh, Japanese uh, kamikaze pilots? Yeah, they uh, were uh, actually celebrating uh, that the war was over uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki that it was over. And uh, they were awakened at four o'clock in the morning and says, we have uh, kamikaze pilots uh, coming toward the ship. Evidently, they haven't heard the wars off. So they all had to scramble and jump in their planes and get up and uh, scramble those kamikazes away from attacking their ship uh, in the early morning hours. So um, that was quite a story in itself. And, and again, uh, you know, call of duty at an odd time of the day uh, to, to defend their ship and, and also our country's victory. Uh, and Bill, also, um, your, your father had uh, an accident, didn't he, when his uh, plane didn't actually reach the, um, the runway of the, uh, the U.S. aircraft carrier. Um, can you share with us how God protect your father uh, through those awful years that, that marked the Second World War? Well, what happened, uh, Simon, uh, it was actually on takeoff. And on takeoff, his engine gave out just over the end of the carrier. And that was before there was ejection seats. So a lot of pilots, uh, uh, or let's say when they had that incident, pilots usually died or went down with the aircraft. But he supernaturally was able to escape from his plane. I, I have a photo of my dad in the water next to his plane that had exploded. And I just, you know, it was supernatural, Simon, that he was able to survive a crash like that. And I, uh, you know, my faith is deeply strong, but I, I'm thankful, obviously, for the fact that my dad survived that crash when many other pilots hadn't. And I'm here today to uh, be super thankful for that. I'm on, uh, one, one, of the, one of the quick note here, Simon, my mother, my grandmother, my dad's uh, mother probably prayed most of us into the kingdom. She was a woman of great faith. So we have to give my grandmother a lot of credit for possibly getting my dad through that very treacherous, dangerous time. Amazing. It just shows really the, the power of prayer. Uh, I just want to read uh, a little quote from uh, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's speech that occurred on the 25th of December, 1941. And this is what he said. He says, therefore, I do hereby appoint the first day of the year 1942 as a day of prayer of asking for forgiveness for our shortcomings of the past, 
of consecration to the tasks of the present, of asking God's help in days to come. We need his guidance uh, that this people may be humble in spirit, but strong in conviction of the right, steadfast to endure sacrifice and brave to achieve victory of liberty and peace. Our strongest weapon in the war is, is that conviction of the dignity and brotherhood of man, which Christmas Day signifies more than any other day or any other symbol. Um, I think the very important question I want to ask really, was it the faith of the vast majority of Americans and also of the British national days of prayer, God fearing president as in FDR Roosevelt and also uh, Winston Churchill that actually God grants us victory against evil that was Nazism and Imperial Japan. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that, Simon. Uh, we had such a strong Judeo-Christian uh, uh, ethic in America, beliefs in America. We were a country of prayer. Many schools, even at that time, started the day with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. I remember growing up in the uh, 60s and 70s in, uh, in Arizona, we started our day with prayer in my school and also a pledge of allegiance. It was just an incredible time. It was all based on our solid belief in God uh, and also a very healthy, reverent, sovereign uh, fear of the Lord. And uh, we, you know, our country, your country has been so blessed by that foundation. And, uh, and no doubt that that got us through a very difficult, precarious uh, time. Uh, you know, I might throw out, too, that uh, we were able to survive. We became a great friend of the state of Israel. Uh, Britain was able to survive and be a force. And I think with uh, Britain, the United States support of Israel and, and the eventual Israel becoming a state, God, because he uh, blessed our faith in our country, also prepared our two countries to be there for the state of Israel, for God's perfect and uh, a sovereign plan of establishment of a future home for the Jews. Well, thank you to Bill Koenig there and uh, to Simon for that fantastic interview. Um, we, we have one email here. The worrying question is the incompetent American administration today any more ready for an attack? That's from Hugh. Um, what, what do you think, Simon? Or is the U.S. administration now any more ready than FDR for such an I attack? I think FDR was a much better and uh, a shrewder politician than, than Biden was yeah. and um, certainly wanted to bring the American people uh, with him. Um, unlike Biden, for example, now with 100,000 troops massed on the Ukrainian border, uh, China on the verge of ready to attack Taiwan, um, allowing the Iranian regime to re-enter into negotiations and to, and to get rid of the sanctions relief, meaning that they could be very close to developing nuclear weapons, which would put the world in an incredibly dangerous place, um, threatening Israel as well by not supporting their main ally is a fellow uh, democratic nation in the Middle East. So again, we're seeing massive strategic blunders on behalf of, of the Biden administration. But um, uh, can you share with us one of the remarkable stories that is not often oh, yeah. known in terms of kind of British awareness of history? Because, yeah, we're aware of our own historical narrative stories when it comes to the Second World War, whether that is uh, beating the uh, Germans in, in North Africa at Tobruk, uh, mm -hmm. the Battle of Britain, uh, the Blitz, um, and of course then, uh, of course, Dunkirk, with that incredible film that was made a couple of years ago. Um, but we don't know so much about this, an amazing story. So please uh, share with us this amazing operation that FDR uh, launched to at attack Japan in 42. Well, viewers, I want to introduce you to the Doolittle Raid, um, like the uh, Dr. Doolittle, basically. Uh, the Doolittle Raid was a one-way mission to bomb um, Japan. In the immediate wake of uh, Pearl Harbor, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, tasked his military leaders with carrying out a strike against Japan that would boost American morale. The damage done to the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor was 
absolutely catastrophic and it limited what the US was going to be able to do in an instantaneous way. They would need to carry out an attack on Tokyo itself in order to do the desired damage and uh, boost the nation's morale. The primary purpose of the raid would be to cause material damage by destroying military targets and subsequently hampering Japanese uh, war production whilst also creating fear in the Japanese populace, making it necessary for military leaders to recall combat equipment from other theaters uh, for home defense. It would ease the pressure on allied units elsewhere in the Pacific as well, and it was hoped that the raid would demonstrate American resolve to other allied powers, as well as give the American people a respite from the torrent of bad news from the fighting fronts. So on April the 1st, 1942, 16 modified B-25s were loaded onto the flight deck of the Hornet at Naval Air Station Alameda, and the carriers steamed out of San Francisco Bay under the cover of heavy fog the following day. Accompanying the Hornet were the cruisers USS Nashville and USS Vincennes, the oiler USS Cimarron, and four destroyers. The flotilla was collectively named Task Force 18 and um, was due to a rendezvous with the carrier USS Enterprise and uh, William Hasley's. Now, um, Hasley dispatched an order to the Hornet, very simple, launch planes to Colonel Doolittle and Gallant Command, good luck and God bless you. An estimated 14 tons of bombs were dropped on the Japanese mainland during the raid. That's massive. Um, and air crews claimed hits on virtually all the assigned primary targets. Several of the planes reported seeing large fires because of the incendiary bombs, while high explosive ordnance did visible damage to factories, ammunition dumps, naval facilities, and military barracks. Only three of the 16 crew failed to reach uh, Chongqing. Uh, Captain Edwin J. York, who had led the third flight of planes into Tokyo, was desperately short of fuel and was forced to land near Vladivostok, yes, in, in Russia. Uh, and, and that's an interesting one as well because he and his crew were then interned by the Soviets in various locations for more than a year before they managed to escape. Where did they escape to? Well, Br British and Soviet occupied Iran. Um, and it was um, wh while there that um, well, it was basically their, their escape was an elaborate NKVD operation that had been staged to repatriate the Americans while giving the Soviets plausible deniability with the Japanese. With Absolutely. So have to, we have to do a program on that in April. Yeah, so you have to wait for April uh, 2022 for us the to do, do that. Raid. Uh, the do little raid uh, for behind headlines. Uh, I just want to finish the program uh, with an incredible speech made by Franklin D. Roosevelt. And this is a presidential message they gave to the American people on Christmas Eve 1940. Uh, and this also brings in very much of where we are today. Uh, and we see with FDR, with, with Churchill, this need for prayer, this need for uh, days of, of national prayer and forgiveness and repentance in order to deliver the West from Nazi tyranny. Uh, this is what he says. He says, uh, uh, fellow workers for freedom, there are many men and women in America, sincere and faithful men, and women who are themselves uh, asking this Christmas, how can we light our trees? How can we give our gifts? How can we meet and worship with love um, and with an uplifted spirit and heart in a world at war, a world of fighting and suffering and death? How can we pause even for a day, even for Christmas day, in our urgent labor of arming a decent humanity against the enemies which beset it. There are natural, inevitable questions in every part of the world uh, which is resisting this evil thing. Uh, he also says that, uh, and even as we ask these questions, we know the answer. There is another preparation demanded of this nation beyond and besides the preparation of weapons and materials of war. There is a demand also for us to, is the preparation of our hearts, uh, the arming of our hearts. And while we make ready our hearts for the labour and suffering and the ultimate victory which lie ahead, then we observe Christmas Day, all of its memories and all of its meanings as we should. And essentially goes on to talk about how 
we need a day of national prayer and a national day of repentance. And he called the first day of January 1942 as, uh, and called for a national day of prayer and repentance. Uh, and this is what we are lacking from our leaders today, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's uh, climate change or whether it's the um, Chinese aggression and threat to Taiwan and the rest of the West, or whether it's Russia's uh, aggression over the Ukraine. Um, these are what our leaders need to be called out to, call, need to be called out for, is to have a national days of prayer and repentance. Because just as in the Second World War, it was God that delivered the West. And again, we need him to deliver us today. And that is why when we look back at the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, we can remember that history is his story. God is sovereign in the affairs of man. And that's what we can learn. So thank you for watching tonight's Behind the Headlines.